Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon. If you enjoy the videos here, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the Word Balloon YouTube channel, and uh, of course, if you enjoy the audios and the videos, you can subscribe to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Hi everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. I am happy to welcome back the creator of Elephant Men, uh, a lot of other uh, great comic books that we'll be discussing today. But uh, it's Richard Starkings. Welcome back, Richard. It's great to see you. Good to see you too, John. How's it going? Doing okay, man. How about you? How's every? I mean, you know, we're in the middle of madness, obviously, uh, both uh, socially and uh, and health wise. But uh, I mean, everything's okay on my end. I hope everything's okay on your end as well. Well, I'm sure you've spoken to a lot of creators who are, you know, this is business as usual, working from home. Um, you know, and uh, I think after about a month, people were posting how many days. They've been in quarantine, and I counted up how long I'd been working pretty much at home, and it was over 10,000 days. So, <laughs> you know, it's it's frustrating not to be able to go out, not to see friends. Um, I would actually be in England right now mm. for a wedding. So that was oh. – yeah, the wedding's been postponed. But yeah. I, I usually go to England twice a year, and I'm not even sure – where the thought bubble will take place later this year, we'll see. Yeah, no, and I agree. San Diego. So that's a whole different. Yeah, San Diego. I know. I know. I was planning on going this year as well. Um, and oh well. Are you going to do any of the virtual panels that they're talking about putting together? I know that they're already putting panels together. So I think some of them are sort of pre-recorded, but because they did some for WonderCon, I think sort of after the fact. Yep. Um, I, I'm. Maybe. I, okay. I, I haven't really looked into it. Um, I am kind of relieved. I've done San Diego every year since 1988. Wow. So this is the first time I'm not going to be in San Diego in, in the summer, which wow. feels odd. But it's also a little bit of a relief, I've got to say, that, you know, it's, you know anyone who's ever – exhibited at San Diego knows how much effort you have to put into it. In fact, I would be preparing right now for San Diego, whether that's the banner, product, shipping, you know, um, we had a plan to do a print and, um, you know, everything is you sort of like, okay, slow it down. You know, we can do that next year. And the fact that everybody's in the same situation is kind of reassuring. I think um, it takes some of that sort of breathless excitement out of San Diego. We've got we've got another year to prepare. A little more breathing room. I understand you're not the first yeah. creator to, or exhibitor to tell me that, both that they're bummed, but also that it is a relief. And it's like, yeah, we could use a break. Um, That's and an you expensive can... week. Everybody who goes to San Diego knows how expensive that week is. I completely agree. Um, oh, there's my there's my dryer. I'm going to turn that off. Hold on one second. <laughs> no worries. One second. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. I'm glad we're pre-recording this. <laughs> yeah, this would have been hilarious. But actually, I was just listening to a podcast by Louis Theroux, who's a British documentarian who did the um, my Netflix movie, uh, my my Scientology movie on Netflix. Um, and his podcast, his is an isolation podcast. And he's depending on the interviewees to record their part of the conversation. 
And there are many interruptions like that, whether it's laundry or a baby crying or battery runs out on the phone. So it's it's interesting that it's putting everybody at the same level. Zoom, Zoom and other streaming um, communication uh, programs are having a boom, let's face it. 100% man. No, and it's funny. I'm I'm leaving all this in Richard because not not the not the pause, but certainly that story. You, you can you can leave it all in. I didn't pick my nose or anything. So <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about this Scientology uh, movie. Uh we we can get to that later because okay. um Louis Theroux is a, a a very popular documentarian in England. He's actually the son of American author Paul Theroux who wrote uh, Mosquito Coast. Sure. And yes. Moon Street. And he's actually inspired the next story arc of Elephant Men. So we can get to that later. Okay, buddy. Yeah, that sounds great. Man, honestly, Richard, I'm always impressed with like the, the various uh, little projects you got going, man. And that's that's terrific. We were just saying we were talking about uh, San Diego and, you know, yeah, that it's kind of a relief and but also a shame. And as you said, it was it's a very expensive uh, con to go to. And it's funny, you know, it, I, I, it, I didn't used to be, did it? <laughs> well, you, you have much more perspective than I do. I only started going in 2006, but um, wow. I, I know. But I, uh, I I took a teaching job this semester that, as most teachers, ended up being a Zoom classroom yeah. uh, halfway through. But I was, the plan was, yeah, to use the teaching money to, like, oh, I can go to San Diego this year. This will be great. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, and, and you know how much it costs then, you know. You know, I've already got my um, hotel deposit back. That was a not insignificant amount of money. I got my booth uh, money back because I don't need to lend anybody that much money for a year. I'm hip. Uh, you know, we are talking yeah. more than my monthly mortgage. It's almost two mortgages. I believe it. In order to have a booth, a corner booth at San Diego for uh five days is is like a mortgage <laughs> no man i know i mean i know talking to sal abenanti uh from uh, alex ross art and you know i mean in his oh, he has a house he doesn't yes. just have a booth he has an apartment <laughs> in the middle of the show floor let's face it and there's sure. a, it's a very well decorated apartment it's a beautiful it's, it's a beautiful nice. setup for I don't know where they get all that artwork on the walls from, but it's a very nice apartment. <laughs> no, I understand. And no, you're right. I mean, and that's that's why even just to go as someone who gets a press badge and be an attendee, uh, I, I always call San Diego really expensive summer camp because it's great. And I see all my friends, all my out-of-town yeah. friends, and it's a great hangout for five days, but it is really expensive. And, uh, you know, as I said earlier, you know, we are all in the same situation. And the, you know, my fellow creators have all commented on the fact that we miss each other. We're not getting to hang out this year. There was no Emerald City. There was no, um, you know, I think C2E2 was canceled. Was it? Which one no, was actually, that was, that was the last one. Uh, we, that we was the it. last one. Yeah. Yeah. So and that so, was like right on the cusp. But yeah, WonderCon and, and Emerald City, you're right. And, um, yeah. you know. Yeah. Megacon, I'm not sure. Would Megacon obviously fall in that area too? Yeah, there was. There's been there was a couple of little shows early in the year in this area because you know I'm in Tennessee now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm waiting to see if Dragon Con gets cancelled, which I don't think they want to cancel because of the amount of money they will lose. You know, if they say, "Well, everything else is open in Atlanta, but we're going to close Dragon Con because that would be just a petri dish." <laughs> I I but that's the thing who out of town is is comfortable enough with traveling too i mean you're right i think atlanta proper and again mm -hmm. well and, and then of course see all the all the terrible unfortunate things that are happening in atlanta right now i mean it's still a few months yeah, away so still, there's more than one reason to be kind of cautious about going to atlanta and i have friends down there me too who aren't you know they're not going out yeah not not because of the protest because of coronavirus yes me um, too you know, and even though the governor of Georgia is like, everything's fine, restaurants can operate at full capacity. Um, yeah. Nobody wants to go. None, not my friends. I, you know, I, 
that most of the people that I know are, mm -mm, it's not over yet. Yeah, man. No, I agree with you. Very sad, man. Um, well, on to, on to interesting things as far as uh, creations you have. Uh, you, uh, you have been releasing stuff at Comixology. And, uh, yeah. you know, so, so tell me about, uh, yeah, your relationship with Comixology. Well, yeah, so there's two uh, ways of publishing through Comixology. As you may know, there's Comixology Submit, which is like self-publishing. But there's also Comixology Originals. And uh, yeah. my two titles, Ask for Mercy and Elephant Men 2261, um, uh, were part of the first wave of launches uh, from Comixology Originals. This is back in June 2018. Um, you know... I had fully intended Elephant Men to wrap after the image run, which was 80 issues, not counting miniseries and one shots. And, um, and I got to issue 80 and I thought that was it. But then I had had a relationship with Comixology since the very beginning, since before Comixology was publishing digital comics, I was interviewed about the launch of Elephant Men. So that must, must be 2005, 2006. Um, and then they approached me to use issue one of Elephant Men to sell the idea of Guided View. So this is 2006. Wow. And I, I was already, um, you know, we, we take digital comics for granted now, but 12 years ago, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, um, all the publishers were really nervous. You know, DC and Marvel had not signed up with Comixology. Everything we take for granted now, everything that 12-year-olds take for granted now, comics on tablets, there was no iPad in 2006. Everything was on little flip phones, right? Right, which, so, um, you know, less than the size of a, of a recipe card or a baseball card. Yeah, and everyone was wondering... What's that going to do to the splash page? And how are, yeah, I mean, how are, you know, and also ultimately too, fear for the local, the, the, the health of, of local shops with the, with, you know, the introduction, I think, of, of uh, digital comics as well. Yeah. And, and I had no fear about this being cannibalistic in any way. And in fact, I still don't think digital comics hurt stores. I think it's the opposite way around. You know, the fact that you can read a comic book in the middle of, you know, the bush in Australia, um, as long as you have Wi-Fi, yep. you can download it, you know. And I, I remember I was at uh, New York Comic Con one year um, or at a signing, and uh, I was with a friend of mine on the subway, and the iPad had only been out a year, but there was somebody sitting on the subway reading a comic book on their iPad. Yep. Yeah. And, and I just looked at that and i was like that's it it's done now it's the kindle for comics right so uh elephant man issue one was the very first wow comic book put yeah. into guided view and was pretty much the first available for sale i made a deal separate from image because image wasn't interested it's 2006 2007. yeah 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 I already, it must be 2008 because I think Comixology has celebrated its 12th anniversary. So I had signed up with Go Comics for the flip phones. Yes. And that hadn't really taken off. Um, I think we got a, maybe a couple of hundred dollars in royalties, but that didn't put me off. It's a different market. I've been selling comic book fonts digitally for We've been selling them for 25 years now, I think. And it's a whole other market. It doesn't – anything that reaches more people, you know, look at where we are now in quarantine. Everybody's ordering online. Everybody's um, operating digitally. Yes. More people are doing calls like this. Absolutely. How you doing? <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I knew that Comixology would just expand the market. And – I think I was saying to you that we, I think we met at C2E2. It wasn't Emerald City, was it? No, it was definitely C2E2 and also uh, at Challengers, one of the great stores here That's in Chicago. Right, yeah. You and Mortad right. were there. 
Um, and I think uh, that, that is early on then. So yeah. I had, yeah, I had breakfast at that C2E2. I think Chip Mosier had just come on board at um, Comixology. He and I uh, were both uh, survivors of graffiti designs. I worked there in the very early 90s. He worked there in the mid to late 90s. So we both had some war stories of working with the wonderful Bob Chapman, um, a, uh, a force of nature, let's call him. Um, and, you know, and I still have a great relationship with Bob to this day. Um, but Chip and I both had experienced uh, that working relationship. So we, we got to know each other and um, he brought me on board uh, what I'd like to call Blade Runner, but is actually called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? They, Ross Ritchie was adapting the novel. And in order to get cert around certain Blade Runner right situation, um, they weren't adapting Blade Runner. They were doing an illustrated version of the novel in graphic novel format. Every word of the book was supposed to be incorporated. So Ross ghost wrote it as, you know, he did the breakdowns. Okay. With with Tony Parker, the artist, and Chip wanted a PR release, so he sort of touted the fact that I was a big Blade Runner fan, uh, that I would be lettering the book, and I I lettered pretty much every single page uh, myself because I'm I, I love Blade Runner too much, um, and there were a lot of words in it, and I did have to upfront say to Ross. You're not picking the font. This is a lot of words. I'm picking a very narrow font that will fit. Um, and to be fair, you know they 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 let they they relied on me for my expertise, and um, it was a great experience. Bryce Carlson was the editor. He was great to work with, and that's that. You know that developed my relationship with Chip. And um, when Chip. Chip had just moved from Boom to Comixology, and we had breakfast with David Steinberger, who's the CEO of Comixology, long yeah. before Amazon um, came to the picture. Yeah, yeah. And we sat down, and I said, so when are you going to start doing originals? A, you know, original material, because, yeah. you know, if you are distributing books digitally, then you are a publisher. And, of course, Amazon and Comixology are not really publishers, but the distrib distribution, as we have learned this summer, is everything. Absolutely. So, um, so I, I, I said, look, you know, when you start doing original material, talk to me because I, I'm, I'm already, I'm ready, I'm ready to publish books digitally because it's only going to expand the market. Um. So that was that's got to be ten years ago, maybe yes, maybe nine, but very early on in Elephant Men days. So I signed up before Image. Maybe two years later, Image then signed everybody up. Mm -hmm. I pushed, I pushed and pushed and pushed for day and date release through Comicsology, and they wouldn't let Eric Stevenson wouldn't let me do it, and then suddenly. Walking Dead was day and date. And the reason they didn't want to do day and date was our retailers will be mad. Sure. You know, yeah. And like, it doesn't matter. It, it will only increase sales because people who read a book digitally and love it want to hold it in their hands. Whether, it that's at a show, yeah. whether that's at a store, whether that's ordering it from Amazon, it, you know, w people go and see movies all the time and, and, and then they order it on blu-ray or, or dvd or whatever format um that there is always that need to you know when when i was young if i liked a movie i would go straight out and buy the the novel sure you know sure. you know there was a star wars novel there was a close encounter the third kind novel i went out and read jaws after i saw jaws and you just want to continue that relationship with something that impacted you right so my argument was always day and date will not affect sales, except it'll it'll help 
especially trade sales, collection sales. Agreed. So uh, finally, Image went day and date, as did all the publishers. And you've got to remember, recent history, this is not long ago. It's maybe seven, eight years ago that, that Image actually went full tilt. Um, and again, it, it only helped sales. It, it certainly helped my bottom line. I don't think I would have made it to issue 80 without those digital sales. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So, so, so when Comixology Originals uh, was mooted, touted, I was like, I'm ready. I, you know, I've got a new series, you know, and I, I had been tinkering around, you know, with another um, project for a little while that had not quite found any traction. But um, I had worked with a wonderful artist by the name of Abigail Jill Harding, who I had seen her work. She did one page in a Thought Bubble anthology. And I was very fortunate because Comic Craft puts together the Thought Bubble anthology every year, which is published through Image. And I had hooked up Thought Bubble with Image. Um, so we were putting together that book. And on the back page was this beautiful one-page strip by Abigail. And I was like, who is this? <laughs> who is this artist? She's ready. She was 22. Wow. And um, I met her. She came to meet me at a signing at Traveling Man in York, where she lives. Okay. And she said, hi, Richard, I'm Abigail Harding. And I said, yeah, did you do the strip on the back of Thought Bubble? And she blushed. She said, yeah, that was me. I said, you're ready. Bring me your folio at Thought Bubble, which is the following weekend, which she did. And I looked through it and I said, would you like to do an issue of Elephant Man? And cut a long story short, she did. Uh, she, if you've seen her art, she loves Doctor Strange. She does a lot of Doctor Strange fan art, and but it's extremely professional, extremely high quality. Yes, and it's very Thulu esque. It's very Lovecraftian. So I I said to her, well, let's do a, a sort of um, homage to Doctor Strange, but let's take your character Alazarine and put him into the Elephant Man universe. And I then wrote a story as if a Lovecraftian Doctor Strange uh, existed in the Elephant Men universe. So it was a little bit of a sort of um, dream world issue. Our, our character Ebony drinks a cup of um, herbal tea and goes on a little bit of a trip <laughs> with uh, this character, Alizarine. And um, it was great. I, I loved her work and I said, you know, um, you should be working professionally. I'm going to send your uh, details out to some publishers. One year later, nobody had contacted her. I called her up and said, Abigail, um, Comixology are uh, fielding um, pitches for series. Would you like to work on it with me? And she was like, absolutely. So we took this character, Alizarine, who's sort of a, a mentor to the team that we put together for Ask for Mercy. We um, hung out a little bit in Leeds uh, four years ago, three years ago. I'm not, I'm not quite sure of the timeline now, but okay. uh, we went to the Royal Armouries, which is right, which is where Thought Bubble used to be partially staged. Yes. And I said, you know, I've always wanted, I, I used to edit, Ghostbusters comic, the real Ghostbusters comic based on the movie, based on the TV show, right? Yes. And when I was editing that, I was thinking this would be so much more interesting if the Ghostbusters were actually ghosts <laughs> and that they, you know, were basically had a, a relationship with the ghosts that they were busting. Um, and I said to her, but, but, but you draw monsters and I want you to draw monsters. What if our team were monsters who hunt monsters, you know? Um, and she uh, she and I sort of threw back, well, we're gonna have Alizari on the team. I had come up with this character uh, whose name at the time was Divinity. And that was gonna be the title of the series, Divinity. And then 
Valiant put out a series called Divinity. That's right. Uh, but that was great because um, I came up with the title Ask for Mercy and Mercy being the central character. So we pitched it to Chip and David at Comixology. Uh, they took one look at Abigail's work and said, we're in. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, and then I said, look, you know, what I would actually also like to do is um, bring back Elephant Man at Comixology. And Chip sort of said, well, let me think about that because it's an existing property. And I said, go and look at my sales on Comixology. He called back the next day and said, oh, yeah, we'll definitely do it. That's definitely great. Elephant Man. Because I have got 90, before we even launched at, at, at uh, Comixology Originals, there were 90 issues of Elephant Men on Comixology. And the beauty of digital comics is everything's always in print, right? So they're always selling. And the, the bigger the library you have, if somebody discovers you fresh, they go back and they buy everything, either yeah, in all. Or, hey, this is only 99 cents an issue. I can get right. this entire run. I can read this on my iPad on the plane. You know, a lot of people come up to me and they read Elephant Man on trains on their iPad, planes, at airports. Yes. You know, uh, they go on a trip into the desert and they take their iPad and they read comics. Whole new way of reading comics. And I say new, uh, you know, you've spoken to a lot of other creators. You know that this is is. This isn't the future. This is already happening. Absolutely. So um, lo and behold, I had two books ready to launch June 2018. Uh, Elephant Men was so easy because Axel and I have worked together. This is our 10th year, maybe 11th year working together. So um, we just kept rolling. There, there wasn't even a break for Axel. Um, I was actually trying to... I, 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 brought him out to WonderCon to promote Elephant Man, but also so he could look for work. And by the time that San Diego came around, I think we'd already agreed to the deal with Comixology. I think, I think maybe my time frame is out of whack because he just didn't stop working. And I had a script for him and um, we thought we would do one five issue series to Comixology. And, that would be a nice little uh, done in one story. And we're, we're currently wrapping up season three with Comixology. Same on Ask for Mercy. Um, Abigail is just working right now on issue two of season three. And because oh, um, season two is coming out, the collection of it on Wednesday, right? It is. And, you know, um, I'll pat myself on the back. You know, Chip and David have been very happy to give us the green light on the season two and season three because we meet the deadlines. You know, um, Abigail struggled for the first year because she was also trying to do a, a weekend job. <laughs> okay. And she. This was her. This has been her second year working professionally, and I had to call her up on the phone, FaceTime actually, and say, Abigail, it's time to stop working at the pub. <laughs> sure. Um, and it was a big step for her, but I don't think she's regretted it. Um, and her work has just gone from strength to strength. It's absolutely, wait till you see season three. I'm excited, man. It's, it it's an invasion of earth and it's staggeringly beautiful. Well, the first volume, Ask for Mercy, starts uh, with assembling the team and they're going up against Himmler in World War II uh, as Himmler and the Nazis search for the Spear of Destiny. Yep. And that's a terrific story. And I'm always – that that whole real portion of Nazi – Very Hitler. real, you know. And, in fact, there was a series on Netflix about the Hitler's Circle of Evil, which was fantastic. It came out right at the right time. Um, I have to admit that, you know, I did so much research on Himmler and the Nazis. Uh, I, I can't wait to forget it because those were some serious evil 
assholes. I'll say assholes. Yes, <laughs> they, 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 I was going to use another word beginning with M and ending with us. All right, fair. you could have. It's okay, buddy. Yeah, you they. they too much it, it, it was, it's dark stuff. It, it, yeah. You know, and, I, yeah. and I'm. You know, I grew up in England. I'm very familiar with Nazi evil. Um, and in fact, you know, the, there is a sort of fine tradition of um, Nazi slash monster hunters. And I was very aware that, you know, Mike Mignola has gone in that direction, you know, in the, the Hellboy movie. Um, but uh, many, many years ago, I think when I was in my teens, James Herbert wrote a book called The Spear uh, about the Spear of Destiny. And I remember it sitting on my dad's bookshelf. He was, he was, he was on for, you know, thick uh, airplane paperbacks, you know, he okay. would drive them at the airport. Awesome. And I remember reading the back of it, just the blurb. And I had not read the novel. And I, I was fascinated with this idea that it was the spear that was stuck into Jesus when he was hanging on the cross and that the yes. blood went into the spear, the spear. So I thought, don't read the book. Just go with this idea. And then, of course, I read the um I, I look. I, I watched the series, and I read more about Himmler's fascination with supernatural artifacts and his belief that he was the reincarnation of a king. All of which is is documented historically. Um, and I did a lot of research. Abigail also does a lot of research. You know, Vevelsberg, which is the castle that features in the finale of *Ask for Mercy* season one, is a very real castle. Wow. Still exist. It's a museum. The the Black Sun mosaic is on the floor still. Wow. Um and then when I got to issue four, I read The Spear by James Herbert just to make sure I hadn't tripped over anything that he had done. And if there were any little coincidental similarities, I erased them. Just just to, you know completely separate from from that idea and it's it's very different because in 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 james herbert's book i think there's a they reincarnate himmler in the 70s it's a very 70s book funny interesting um, yeah um and my roommate was obsessed with james herbert he read a lot of james herbert and i was a stephen king guy so um <laughs> but you know our story is not really about the Spear of Destiny. It's about these creatures that Abigail came up with. I, I called them the Croach, but she had had a dream of these insect-like creatures, these monsters, um, and she basically drew what she dreamt. So wow. it was this way of sort of, okay, let's merge these two ideas together. Um, I was a big fan of a TV series called Secret Army, which was set in Belgium during World War II. And it was about a group of resistance fighters. And in, in actual fact, Mercy is very loosely based on the character of Yvette from Elephant Man, who's a resistance fighter in the world of Elephant Man. And that was my first attempt to sort of do World War II in a science fiction situation. And this was World War II in a science fantasy situation. Because Brit the British are obsessed with World War II. It's the last time we won anything. Well, and also, I mean, yeah, just uh, the, well, the the war was at your front door. I mean, my God, uh, you know, the bombing was happening in your country. We yeah. were, you know, in the States, we were safe by the ocean and everything and had very few engagements. There are a couple of little, you know, skirmishes along the California coast and things like that. And Pearl Harbor, yeah. And, well, and certainly Pearl Harbor, absolutely. But, yeah, no, I, I get it. And also, uh, Richard, uh, you know, the spirit of destiny, my first awareness came – from Roy Thomas and the Justice Society. And oh, I was that, not even aware of that. Yeah, that he 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 picked up on it too. And it's funny because it is it ha it is one of those totems of the DC universe that they have leaned on a few times over the years. Oh, so, I so. didn't know that. Yeah, I'm yeah. not a big DC guy. I didn't read a lot of DC. In, you know, when I was reading comics in the seventies, I started with Mighty World of Marvel, which is a Marvel UK reprint. And DC didn't have that kind of presence. You could sometimes pick up on the news in, in the news agents, as we call them. I've got to remember my English terminology. I've lived here too long. Ah. Um, in the news agents, sometimes you would get copies 
of DC Comics, and they were stamped T and P, which was the name of a distributor. And this is before Nick Landau and Titan started importing comics. There was a very famous two months, two or three months where Marvels were not distributed on, uh, into news agents in in England, and that those two months included the death of Gwen Stacy. Wow! So a lot of collectors went crazy like how do we get hold of these two comics and i remember my brother tracked down copies of i think it's like spidey 121 122 that sounds right yeah and he paid the princely sum of two pound 50 for each and to this day they still sell more in england than they do over here and that's why interesting sure wow you know, and my brother used to get a hold of what were called Air Force Base copies. And they had they were remarkable because they were always in great condition because they had a cardstock insert stapled in advertising engagement rings to American Air Force squaddies, you know. <laughs> so that cardstock insert meant that it was very difficult for the, the copy to get beaten up, right? So yeah. I, I think those two copies of Spidey that he got a hold of had that insert in. So they were they were they were near mint, as we like to say. Sure, that's amazing. Am I right, Richard? That also DC Comics uh, and maybe American comics in general. I, I always love hearing from from people from the UK that would say they came over uh, in ships as ballast. Ballast, yeah. Ballast copies were always very crinkly. Sure, um, absolutely. Because I'm assuming they were like in big blocks to be weight to, to yes. literally, you know, yeah. uh, you know, balance the ship's weight. And, and unfortunately, and you know, they probably, as time's gone by because of the sea, what the sea salt, because of the salt that got into them, they probably deteriorated at a faster rate, but yes, ballast copies. You, that you know, if you couldn't get a regular edition of a Marvel comic, you would settle for a ballast copy, but ideally you wanted a air force based copy. That's amazing. I, knew, I never knew that story about the Air Force Base copies. That's amazing. Yeah, and then we, so. of course, we had the diamond where the UK price was actually printed on the issues. Um, some of the, I want to say, still only 35 cents was sometimes translated into pence too. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't keep any of my collection from the 70s and 80s. So, <laughs> I you know, understand. But to, to this day, sometimes I find a, a comic that was not well distributed in England and I have to overcome the desire to buy it because it seems so cheap to me over here. You That's know. amazing. You know, Richard, I'm sure you know, obviously with Diamond and DC parting ways. And I mean, it still hasn't shaken out, at least the last time I looked at what was going on with the new DC distributors. But I had I had Rich Johnson on the day that it was announced because I wanted to hear from someone that obviously was closer to you know the european market and it didn't even occur to me in terms of well now how do we get comics over here i mean every batman's global well and it's i like, gotta believe you know the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that diamond uk is not owned by diamond diamond uk was formerly titan distributors yes and i think they were bought out and they renamed themselves with that relationship but in actual fact, the way Diamond UK functions, and and you know, the best person to talk to about about that is Mike Holman at Diamond UK. Um, I went to visit their warehouse when Elephant Man was launched, just to sort of understand how sure. they distributed over there. Yeah, and that was the first thing he told me was like, well, we're not really um, Diamond. That. So they function, they order as is Midtown. So Midtown. What is it? Lunar distribution? Is that Midtown? Midtown actually, ironically, is UCS and DCBS is Lunar. But go on. Okay, so... UCS, which is Midtown. Either one of them. This idea that retailers can't be distributors, BS. They, okay. They, um, Midtown in particular, they have a warehouse. They, they're equipped. They have to service something like four stores in New York. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. As, been, is, as is discount comic book service. I've, I've seen their warehouse. I've been receiving my Marvel comics for the, for the last two years. The comps that come from Marvel are shipped to me from Midtown. I have heard that. Yes. Right. So they're already in the business of distributing comics, whether those are comps or comics. What It doesn't matter. 
you know, Nick Landau started Titan in order to distribute comics so that he could get his own comics. Yeah. Right? It's the same <laughs> thing. It's the same thing. So the fact that Midtown are um, operating as a hub is exactly what Diamond UK have been doing. So Diamond UK placed one order with Diamond. They get a deep discount, right? Sure. So they then resell to the retailers in England. There's yes. no reason why Diamond UK can't strike up that relationship with DC. Just because the word Diamond is in their name, why would they not? You know, okay. everybody's okay. suffering right now financially. Certainly. Every business has to do what it needs to do to survive. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are much more educated people on the subject of distribution than I. Understood. Um, but I, I, I don't see a problem with it. I just see it as more of the same. You know, um, we are an industry that's unusually fueled by fans. So thank goodness Nick Landau figured out a way of distrib distributing American comics in the 70s. I wouldn't be here without that. I'm hip. Yeah, yeah. God bless him because he created a situation where I could walk into a store in Leeds and pick up Uncanny X-Men 137, Daredevil 181, only because there was a gap in the schedule of shipping and fans like Nick had – relationships with people overseas that's that's all distribution it ever is that's that, that's all the comicsology is it's distribution you know so yes um, you know anything that helps our industry evolve and survive i think is a good thing and i know everybody's saying that the sky is falling it's not <laughs> publishers are making money through different avenues um Distributors always make money. Creators are usually the last to make money. Retailers make money if the product sells, no question. It's a physical product, they sell it. Sure. Distributors have sold the product to retailers. Distributors always make money, especially if there's if there's no returns, right? Right. I, I, I wonder where diamonds rainy day fund was because they stopped paying bills very very quickly and and that sent a shudder through the industry and companies like warner brothers and at&t they don't like industries to shudder yes they don't want movie theaters shut down wait, wait wait movie theaters shut down and our comic book stores can't get any product where are we going to sell our product that's the question that every single person in the comic industry is asking themselves all the time right yes my local retailer had been doing a fantastic i'm, I'm going to give a shameless plug to infinity go ahead In, infinity flux just I, I couldn't have moved to a better uh, location for my local comic book store it's five minute drive from my house literally door to door it's one song on the radio and i'm there <laughs> uh, what what town in tennessee chattanooga tennessee fantastic um, Oh, that's great. I, I have friends who live in Chattanooga. That's wonderful. Very beautiful, nice. Beautiful, beautiful, picturesque city, a little progressive bubble in the south. That's what I've heard, which is amazing. That's great. And Infinity Flux is on Hickson Pike, and they had to close. Oh, um, yeah. they, they had paid all their diamond bills. They did not owe diamond any money. So when diamond announced that um, retailers weren't paying their bills, some retailers were like, we paid our bills. We, we need to do curbside service. We need to stay open. We need to survive. Um, and they have been doing Facebook Live events and have sold a lot of back issue collections that they purchased, a lot of books that were sitting on the shelves, and they, they survived. They, they didn't look to Diamond or DC to sort something out because they had bills to pay. They had rent. Yeah. Right? They had, they had um, staff. They kept everybody on staff. Wow. Um, That's great. So, um, sorry about the pinging. My uh, oh no 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 again. We this is what yeah. we were talking about in terms of when we're doing live. Yeah, live video. I, I was going to tell you, Mike Oming's cat walked very quickly across the uh, the back of the, the the picture on his on his end and stuff. Yeah, like, oh, I'm so happened. sorry. I'm like, I don't care. It's life, man. It's all same good. Same thing happened to my wife when she was on a um, 
Toastmaster's call. Ah! A, a giant cat jumped up on the keyboard. Um, <laughs> Does so, she compete in Toastmasters? Well, my uh, it's, it's not a competition, but she's actually been able to rejoin her group in Long Beach at the aquarium because all her friends um, have been doing it on Zoom and she's still connected uh, with some of the people that work there. So she's now actually taking an active role in the Toastmasters Club. So that's uh, amazing. I have I have a friend who does it in Chicago. Right. And, so so yeah, he yeah. Jeff Stein is his name and he competes and he goes to competitions and 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 all, all over the country and stuff. And the big convention in Vegas back when they were working. And, and you know a lot of people are saying now, you know, I'm not going to Vegas anymore if I can zoom in. <laughs> Why should I spend all that money when I can just appear on Zoom and then go and have, you know, leftovers out of the fridge afterwards? I think <laughs> this, this is definitely a world changing event that well, we are now realizing that we can do this. You know, you don't have to wait for a show to come rolling around. You know, no, it, all all businesses are changing because of what's going on. We don't know what the new normal is going to fully look like. And uh, even as shops open up and restaurants and the like, but also the comic book business and truly Richard, I mean, I, I, uh, I talked to Chip about the Comixology's originals just a couple of weeks ago and congratulated uh, Ed Brubaker and Marcos Martin for a panel syndicate and uh, their new release right at, at, at the point where it was, Hey, no new comics for a while. And it's like, well, we've got one. And everybody jumped because it was Ed Brubaker and Marcos Martin. And it's like yeah, all these superstars are always walking through the door after I've kicked it down for them. <laughs> That's the problem with being a pioneer. It's true, Richard, same honestly. Thing, but it's anything happened with comic book lettering. Were you were, did you see a tick up in the I mean, I don't know if you've gotten numbers yet from March yeah, or things yeah, like that. There's definitely been a tick up and we don't get numbers in the same way that image provides numbers, but um uh we do get royalties and um there is a lot of confidence in As for Mercy and Elephant Men. Um I have a great relationship, I think, with David and Chip. And um uh, you know, again, I, I know how to put together a comic and and, and deliver. And yeah. I requested on season three, um, I, I said to Chip, can we get three issues in the draw before you announce? Because we announced very quickly and other books, um, Super Freaks was finished and actually I think launched as all five issues. Um, Stone King was almost finished. I'm okay. looking because I have the books right in front of me. Yeah. Um, but we were one. We were the first one that was like, you know, Savage Game was a done in one, forty eight page one shot. But I was the first creator to be putting out a monthly book, monthly, you know, um, every six weeks. Um, and we had about two, three. We had th three. We were halfway through issue three when it launched, and they wanted it out monthly, which of course you do. Sure. Um, sure. And that caught up with me halfway through issue two on both series. So I actually requested, wait until we have three in the drawer. We are just finishing issue four of season three of Elephant Men. Outstanding. So that launches next month. And we'll be working on issue five when issue one comes out. Ask for Mercy, we won't even announce the season three. I guess I just announced it, but... Um, we will launch that when Abigail finishes. What is she on? Is she on two or three? Did I say two? I think she's on issue two. Well, you said you wanted three in a can, so yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, so I've issue. got it. I want. I want to say this is issue three. She's working on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, and also, Richard, I got a press release initially, and that's one of the reasons why I contacted you from uh, David Hyde's uh, group, Superfan. Superfan, yeah. And, and it was from Pamela Mullen, and, and she's like, hey, Richard Starking. And I'm like, I would love to talk to Richard. And she's like, actually, they kicked down, and I thought it was Elephant Men that they kicked down the schedule until, and maybe that's for the image uh, release rather than the comicsology release. I don't know. There is no image release. Oh. So each volume of Elephant Men, I have them right in front of me. Yes. These are print on demand. Okay, great. You can order these. For the low, low price of nine ninety nine, outstanding, and the, the they look 
like any trade paperback Absolutely. you've ever held in your hand. Of course. The quality is right up there. Um, so there's two volumes of Elephant Men. This is uh, uh, Death of Shorty, which is volume one. And this is The Pentalion Job, which is volume two. Look at that beautiful cover <laughs> by Boo Cook. Good stuff. Boo man. is, you know what? Boo, Boo inspires me. He does one page, the cover, each issue. Um, but he has so much energy and so much. He, his color palette is sparkling. It's like a lozenge. Um, we call it boo goo um, because he, he seems to squeeze out of his fingers into the screen colors that we've never imagined. And um, you know, uh, he, he's 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 a 2000 AD creator, legendary 2000 AD creator, and um, I am so fortunate to have him on Elephant Men. And in, in fact, you know, so you asked me about Louis Theroux and the Scientology. Yes, yes please. Yes. Um, now, Louis actually, um, his um, he has some of his documentaries you can look up um, on HBO Max because they've, they've put a lot of the ones that he did in America on yeah. HBO Max, they're all available on BBC iPlayer. Most people in England will be familiar with Louis. Um, uh, I I got I got addicted to his documentaries because everything was on BBC iPlayer this last year. So, and I just I, I love his style. He's very funny. He's very conversational, and he's very compassionate. And um, he really gets to know the people, even if they're Nazis. You know, he's he did a documentary about nazis in america he did a doc he's done three documentaries about the westboro baptist church wow you know which yes. is you know homophobic um you know sort of white is right god-fearing group in america in um they they're anti-superhero as well. Am I correct? Aren't they the group yeah, that shows they up in San Diego? Like, and it's so funny because it sounds like oh, it's going to be a big demonstration, and it's six people. You know, Superman yeah. is not God. In fact, I think Dave Hine did a Daredevil story about them. Um, I'm not sure. If that, I'm not <laughs> thinking of something else, but um, so Louis, amazingly, even when his subject matters are opposed to him. He befriends them. And, and, the, and he kept going back to the Westboro Baptist church. In fact, one of the girls, one of the daughters of the daughter of Fred, uh, I can't remember, but the pastor that started the Westboro Baptist church. Okay. Separated from the church and contacted Louis and they made a new documentary about her and her book, you know? Wow. Um, and so he, he is sort of this force for good. I, I would say again, a compassionate, human being and i always feel like elephant men is about compassion you know about overcoming your fear of the other and um understanding minorities you know all yes. all these themes have been a part of elephant men for the last 14 years i'm a buddhist buddhism is a compassionate enlightened life philosophy and i think it naturally came up out of my work um, I'm a big fan of Doctor Who. Doctor Who is a compassionate force for good. And I started watching Louis' documentaries. You know, I've watched almost all of them at least once, mo mo most of them two or three times. And I started wondering, what if he was introduced to the world of the elephant men and made a documentary about them? So in the fine tradition of 2000 AD where real life characters would crop up in 2000 AD. John Wagner famously put Hitler in Strontium Dog and uh, <laughs> Ronald Reagan was in the shower with Durham Red. I'm, I'm a big fan of taking historical characters and putting them in science fiction stories to see how they react. Um, the Strontium Dog story was called the Schickelgruber Grab and it was about bringing Hitler to justice on the last day of on his last from his they, they snatch him out of time from the bunker yeah 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 and um 
there were often British news commentators parodied in Judge Dredd. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a very British thing to, to send up things that we love. And I'm spitting not, image. I'm a massive fan image, of spitting yeah. image. My God, those puppets are amazing. So um, Theo LaRue meets the Elephant Man is season three of <laughs> Elephant Man for Comicsology Originals. And, it, you know, it's, I hope it's a very, it's a very affectionate um, portrayal of a character who may or may not be <laughs> like the BBC <laughs> documentarian Louis Theroux. Um, but it's actually very interesting because I started reading Paul Theroux um, in order to sort of just – just I, 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 I'm a research junkie, so I read all these books about Nazis for season one. We haven't even talked about season two of Ask for Mercy, which is the Battle of Little Bighorn. And I chose the Battle of Little Bighorn because I used to have a board game there was a board game in England by Waddington's called the Battle of Little Bighorn. Wow. My sister and I used to play it all the time, and I knew very little about Custer. Interesting. Um, so when we decided to do the story of Casa, who's the Native American sort of shaman in the Ask for Mercy, and when, when it came to do season two, I said, well, I'd like to do a story set in the Wild West. And um, the 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 myth of the white buffalo woman, who we call Casa, is a big part of um, Lakota legend. And it, it led me back to Battle Little Bighorn. And I now live near the Trail of Tears, which I had, I didn't know what that was. I, I wasn't educated on Native American history. Yeah, why would you be? Absolutely, yeah. I, yeah. So I started researching the Trail of Tears and President Andrew Jackson, who is Trump's poster boy. Yes, indeed. Um, you know, Trump's always being photographed with that portrait of Andrew Jackson in the background. And now we know why, right? So, <laughs> so Andrew Jackson makes an appearance in wow. Ask for Mercy season two. It's one, actually David Steinberger, the CEO of Comixology, uh, wrote me a little fan letter about that issue because it was so off the wall. Um, and we, you know, we feature General Custer and his presidential hopes, and we tie up with the Battle of Little Bighorn um, wow. and Iktomi the Spider God. So um, I sort of went off on a tangent there. I went from Louis no, but, to General Custer, but... Um, I, th I think, you know, when you are able to use science fiction, science fantasy as a lens to look at the real world and, and you know, by bringing um, a documentarian into Elephant Men, I, you, you, you look at your own characters through a different point of view. Um, and, yes, that's that was going to um, uh, launch last week and we we rolled it back for reasons okay <laughs> no problem man no hey when and when it's ready we'll we'll talk about it so that's great um well and also uh, you know you say uh, that but it'll be 10 more years before you call me again bullshit no i <laughs> honestly richard i i do as you know honestly ruck and i were talking last night live on video and uh i've been trying to get sean martinborough on word balloon and all of a sudden weeks become months become years and I suddenly realized, oh, Jesus, it's been forever. There's a lot going on in comics, that's for sure. Well, and, and truly. And I mean, well, and and now, uh, I mean, I'm literally quadrupling my output, certainly during the virus. Yeah. Uh, Word Balloon is becoming a full-time concern. Uh, my radio job, uh, unfortunately, was a victim of the virus. Open commercials? <laughs> no, not anymore. Exactly. Yeah. We're sponsoring you, John. I was, I, was, I was actually doing traffic reporting for the CBS news station. Which is the last thing I expected to be doing in radio, and and well, I really enjoyed the job. You have a golden voice, John. You have a oh, golden voice. Thanks, buddy. Well, and we'll <laughs> see what happens. I mean, I'm not saying I may not go back, but but honestly, you know, radio keeps downsizing, so it is yeah. kind of tough out there. Uh, I like what I do online, and and it, and I'm pleased that I have enough of an audience and sponsorship 
that is making it work. So I'm I'm very fortunate as far as that goes. But but you know, so yeah, I but but also no, you're doing this amazing stuff. And I do I wanna if you if you don't mind before we wrap, I want to talk about beef and you and Shaky Kane. The beef. The yes. beef. Man, as I told you, I'm glad I I'm glad I read it when I was not eating. But and speaking well, then of you must, got, you must have got tissue five then. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, more historically, Gandhi makes a fine appearance through the series, so that's lovely. And and again, you know, what was really interesting about Gandhi and and President Andrew Jackson is that they sort of pushed their way into the story. I was not expecting Gandhi to be such an important character in the beef, um, but you know, sometimes you you need that voice. You know, you need a, a, a perspective on your story. And um, the background on the beef was, firstly, I, I, it completely surprised me. I had no idea I had that story in me. Yeah. Um, I wanted to work with Shaky Kane again because we did three issues of Elephant Men. And it was a blast working with him because whatever he draws is unsettling. <laughs> you know, I do. <laughs> so he had done three issues, the Elephant Man. The first one was about a woman who wanted her entire skeleton replaced with ivory. Um, that was called the Lovely Bones. That was issue thirty-three, thirty-four. Wow, of that long Man. ago. God damn. All right. Yeah, it was a long time ago, and I didn't. You know, and he really enjoyed it. And it was really bizarre because I wrote it and then I was like, who wrote this? It's weird. So I wrote him another issue in the 40s, issue 46, I think, about a blue skin guy like Andy Warhol. And it was it was Andy Warhol meets uh, Russ Meyer. It was a very, again, it was a very unsettling story that I would never have expected to have written. And, and partly is you, you hand over a script to Axel and you get one story. You hand it over to Shaky and you get something else entirely. And I would also say Abigail. Abigail brings out imagery out of me that I didn't know was there because I, I want to th – the, the more an artist gives back to you, the more you're like, oh, my God, the, this one's coming at 180 miles an hour. I've got to, you know, give it my best forehand. You know, so um, – so with Shaky, the original idea was to do a version. We're both big fans of Fantastic Four. Okay. And I, Eric Stevenson and I had breakfast once in, when, back when they were in Berkeley. And he said, I just think Shaky should just redraw the Fantastic Four starting with issue one. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I nev I'm never – I'm, I'm not good with – other people's franchises i'm you know and even the idea of doing something like challenges a sort of version of the fantastic four um i'd rather write the fantastic four and i don't want to write the fantastic four <laughs> it's I been understand. done yeah right yeah. You know? so that sort of turned around in my mind and then uh tyler shane line was working at image at the time and he and i got along really well very different with very different people but he and a group of people from Image were at New York Comic Con one year. They called me and said they were having dinner, which usually I would have been there at, at a Chinese restaurant. Okay. And they said, Richard, we miss you, but we're talking about our favorite Marvel characters or superhero characters. Who Who's your favorite? And I said, Silver Surfer. Cool. And it's not actually, it's the thing, but they put me on the spot. And And I said, Tyler, who's your favorite character? And he said, I've got five. The Goon, uh, The Thing, The Hulk, Hellboy, and The Beast. And I said, they're all the same. And he, he said, no, they're not. I said, yeah, they are. They're all knuckleheads. <laughs> and he said, he said, you're a knucklehead. And I said, you know what? That would be a great idea for a team book, The Knuckleheads, right? <laughs> so our first idea, and I said, I know exactly who would draw that. It would be Shaky. So our first idea was called Knuckleheads. Okay. Quick Google search, already a book called either Knucklehead or Knuckleheads. So I was like, well, that doesn't work. And then I was like, you know what? I don't want to write five knuckleheaded characters 
who's the straight guy? How do you make that work? And I, uh, I had lunch with Scott Koblish. Uh, we, we used to be neighbors and we went to the same store, Comic Bug in Manhattan Beach. Okay. Um, another call out, great store. Um, Mike Wellman now has his own store, Atomic Basement. Call out for Mike in Long Beach because every Lovely. store needs help right now. I am all for the local uh, shop yeah. shout outs. This is all good. Go, go and back your local comic book store. Indeed. Um, so Scott had a great idea. I said, what's your creative creator, creator idea? And I can't tell you the name of it, but it had the word the. And, and it was a great title. I was like, oh, I need a great title like that. And I thought, well, what do all these knuckleheads have in common? And I thought, well, they're all big beefcakes. They're all just beefcake characters. And I thought, well, the beef. Quick Google search. No comic book character called the beef. So I pitched this to... Tyler, Tyler used to run the image booth at every show, and we were at Emerald City. And we we went and sat down in the bar just down the street from the convention center, and we got talking about. I, I said, "I've got a great title. I don't know what the story is, but the title is the Beef." And he said, "Oh, I grew up in Stockton, and I don't know if you know Stockton, California, but it's a beef town." Oh wow! Well, coming from Chicago, you know we're a beef town. So go on. Yeah. Well. This, this is the place where you drive up when you drive on the five, I think it is, to San Francisco. You smell Stockton before you get there. I understand. And um, you drive past, and there are all these sad looking cows on yeah. dry earth by the side of the road. Very sad, brown cows, brown pasture. I don't know what they eat, they don't eat grass. Wow. And, that, and that's where Tyler's from. And I think he, I think it used to be called Shipsville. I can believe it. You know, so yeah. I'm sitting there with Tyler taking notes. He's telling me about all these horrible things that went on in the town that he grew up, which may or may not be Stockton. We don't want to slander anyone. <laughs> um, so I'm like, Tyler, this, this comic's going to be about you. It's about where you grew up. It's about a cow town. And again, because I'm a reference junkie, I read... I read a book called, uh, oh, what's it called? It's the guy that Oprah spoke to about the beef industry, the guy that's now a vegetarian. Oh, okay. Um, of course he is, yeah. It's, it's got cowboy in the title. Anyway, I just read everything I could. I watched every video on YouTube, every disgusting. I am a vegetarian. This is I, a comic book for vegetarians. I, I assumed as much reading it and assumed yeah. you were a vegetarian, of course, yeah. Uh, Shaky and his wife became vegetarian by the time he finished issue five. Uh, his, his wife actually had to have open heart surgery. Oh, wow. Well, so that's good she for her that to go, yeah, she needed change to go her diet. Yeah. I don't know if they're still vegetarian, but that's what they told me Wow. two years ago. Because this, this is a book that came out, it overlapped Elephant Men. And okay. You know, it's funny because I used to read a lot of Stephen King short story collections, and, and he used to say that, you know, when he'd finished a novel, and of course he writes them much quicker than I write 80 issues of Elephant Man, but <laughs> that he'd have gas left in the tank and he'd write a short story. And I think this was my gas left in the tank because the beef is far and away one of the most, my favorite, the favorite thing of all I've written. And, um, you know, Tyler <laughs> Tyler and I worked fairly closely on the first issue. He contributed a lot of the backstory, but then I just went off. I just you know, I all my little vegetarian research, all the ethical treatment of animals research I'd done for yeah. elephant men. Yes. I, I it was already there, you know, my you know, Buddhist practice, my um I watched Gandhi again. Every everybody in England has watched Gandhi at least once. Um, you know, and it, it just came out right. Done, done. Don't need to do any more. No, no sequel. No, no rematch. Don't want one. Right. <laughs> As a boxing fan, I appreciate the Rocky reference. Yeah. Very nice. Although I should probably a bad analogy because there've been what nine Rocky movies now. <laughs> <10? laughs> 
you're right, eight of them. Um, and I am thinking, I, I, I have been plotting a new series uh, that I'd like to work on with Shaky, but that's not even, it's, it's not a sequel. It's just, okay. it's just in the, what I call the Shaky verse. I understand. All, <laughs> all the Elephant Men issues that Shaky drew are, Do in my mind, in the Shaky verse, not the Elephant Men universe. Richard, I don't know if you ever knew this, but my radio nickname for 16 years is Shaky. No way. I swear to God. I, in fact, refer to the company that I have for Word Balloon as Shaky Productions because- Why is that? Why? why you know, I have a tremor and also um, I had uh, three years in between working in radio, in music radio into talk radio and sports talk radio. And when I was uh, producing and running the board, they were like, uh, and uh, they, they're like, man, you trouble behind the board a lot. We're calling you Shaky from now on. And I'm like, okay, I've heard worse nicknames in yeah. radio. So I'm okay with it. And it's so funny when the two worlds intersect and I'll be at a Comic-Con and especially in Chicago and people are like, I'm sorry, were, were you Shaky on the score? And I'm like, yes, That's I am. Funny. So, well, and, and Shaky Kane has a tremor too. That's there you go. I kind of figured. Yeah. That's amazing. And my God, what great art. And yeah. he's got a very Bob Burdett, uh, Flaming Carrot kind of sensibility for people who maybe aren't aware of I shaky can stuff. See that. There's a kind of sort of awkwardness that they share. But I think he also has a Jeff Darrow insanity. Absolutely. You yes, know, the indeed. Line work and, um, you know, and there's Jack Kirby behind it all as well. Agreed. Absolutely, both of those influences. Yeah. I completely agree with that. And no, his stuff has always been so amazingly unique. And yeah. really, I mean, when you when you told me you made this series with him, I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, okay, great. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be really visually it's really, exciting. It's really weird because we we love working together. He he's great, so man. happy, you know. And um, I had this idea that every cover would be a physical object because I knew that JG Rochelle, who's worked with me 27 years, you know. Um, I knew that he would love to make a milk carton uh, and all the other things that are on the covers. The spam know. tin and uh, yeah. the, the package yeah. beef in, in, in issue five on the cover and stuff. Because or, I, you know, and I wanted the beef to be branded just like <laughs> McDonald's, just like, you know, Montano, you know, uh, Monsanto. And, um, sure, sure. You know, uh, I, I wanted that kind of... You know, it's actually the funny thing is the other influence on it is Lana Del Rey. Wow. Who was the queen of Americana, you know. And in fact, I went to, I was stuck on a story title and I went to a Lana Del Rey concert and came up with, I was like, oh, I know, that's what she would call it. She'd call it red, white, and blue, you know. And, you know, if you've ever listened to Lana Del Rey, she really knows what it's like to be living in America. And that that's, yeah. That's what struck me about Shaky is that he's an Englishman with a keen sense of Americana. Um, he loves Pez dispensers. He loves gumball machines and everything that, you know, we grow up in England sort of looking at the ads in the back of comic books and um, we, we, you know, X-ray specs and um, uh, sea monkeys. Yes. You know, when, when my kids were little, I had to get them sea monkeys because I didn't know what the hell they were. Sure. You oh, know, there is. and I always feel like Shaky's comic books are, are like, what if somebody took all the ads from the back of old comic books and turned them into a comic strip? <laughs> right? Yes. You know what I mean? I do. So, and honestly, I love that about not only the two of you, but truly uh, people like James Robinson as well. All of these great creators from the from the other side of, of the ocean that look at America and have a very different perspective, not only on Americana, but also like specifically in a lot of ways, the superheroes. And, and it's I, just do, I don't think I could have written the beef if I hadn't lived here 30 years. You know, now that I've lived here 30 years, I can I can write Americana in a, in a way that is informed because I lived in California 27 years, uh, because I understand the immigration problem. I understand yeah, yeah. the picked by immigrants. I understand that, you know, so many people get a job at McDonald's because that's that's all they're trained for, you know. Yeah. And there are people like Chuck everywhere in America. And it, it was just a great, you know, Tyler, Shaky and I just meshed and... I couldn't have written that without Tyler. Having said that, he he couldn't have come up with the, the Gandhi stuff and the 
how cows are impregnated. Um, yeah. There's, there's a lot in there that, you know, um, if it's too weird, I blame Tyler. <laughs> Nothing it's, too weird. You know, and or, or if it's if it's too disgusting, I blame Shaky. Um, but it's, it's shocking in a great way, Richard. It's very it really does. It hits all the serious it's kind of comforting too. You know, it's, it, I don't know what you think about the ending, but you know, I could do a sequel. Sure. I just don't, I don't know what I would say in a sequel. And, and, you know, okay. when we, when we were doing knucklehead, when we had this sort of vague idea of a group of knuckleheads, my question to Tyler was like, well, what's it about? You know, for me, you know, what is the story about, you know, as for mercy, it's about human evil. You know, there, there might be monsters out there, but humans, oh, they're the real monsters, you know. Yes. And Elephant Men is about fear of the other. And the beef is about what are we eating? What do we eat? You know, no no yeah. wonder we end up crazy. Yeah, and obese and when, diabetic. No, no wonder there's an opioid crisis. Yes. When, when we're stuffing ourselves with toxins all the time. And everything that I've referenced in the beef is research. It's, I didn't make it's it real. up. Yeah. Yeah. Excitotoxins are real things, you know, that, and I couldn't believe what was going in sodas, you know. Yes. Yes. I've, I've broken myself of the soda. Yeah, me I, too. I, not completely. I have to admit, I actually had two Cokes yesterday. But I, first I now, Cokes I've had in six months. I now can't drink Coke. I mean, my wife and I used to split a Mexican, a bottle of Mexican Coke. Sure. And now it's just, because, you know, we're close to being as vegan as, as possible for us. That's right awesome, now. man. That's fantastic. And, and once you start eating more vegetables and fruit and unprocessed foods, your your taste buds change. The sweetness of Coca-Cola now is too much for me. And I used to have about six cans a day. When we had a me too, buddy. in the Comic Craft studio, yeah. Oh, when I was a teenager, I would easily have a six pack a day. Yeah. Absolutely, man. And, and you're right. And you know, I don't have any kind of six pack, if you know what I mean. Well, well <laughs> <laughs> you know, Richard, honestly, uh, being in my mid fifties and stuff, I really got hit with, and that's no excuse, but it's the truth. It was the worst time when processed food was just so prevalent and so matter of fact, and nobody thought about. There you go. There's your cover. And Absolutely, kid, man. Kids, you don't want to end up looking like this guy. No, absolutely not. Exactly, that's a good. Yeah. That's a good warning. Absolutely, man. You know, I, no. I just, I, I love the beef. I love working with Shaky. I feel blessed that he enjoys working with me because I remember actually Eric Stevens said, "Why can't we get him working with Grant Morrison?" And I was like, "Excuse me, I'm right. Yeah, about, here. I'm right in front of you. <laughs> Who doesn't need to work with Grant Morrison? He's quite happy." And I know, of course, Grant would sell more copies, but hey, I'm a vegetarian too. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, Richard, really strong writing in the beef, really strong writing in Ask for Mercy, and Elfman's uh, Elfman's always a delight. So, yeah, well, and is... you know, I said that the beef is is one of the most favorite things I've written, but Ask for Mercy season two, I had so much fun, and I think. I couldn't have written As for Mercy season two if I hadn't written the beef. Because Interesting. the beef gave me way more confidence. Abigail had more confidence drawing season two. She's just off off the leash on season three. She's learned so much about storytelling. Her artwork is just gorgeous. But um I I now think I used to think of myself as the creator of Elephant Men and not a writer. Now that I've done the beef and asked for mercy. I think of myself as a writer, you know, as, as someone that can look forward to the next new project that I'm going to do. And hopefully um, the, the, the next thing I do alongside As for Mercy and Elephant Men will be a new project with Shaky. I hope. We're, we're lettering a project that he did called, what's it called? We're just about to start working on it. I can't remember what it's called. He'll hate me. <laughs> um, but we're working on a project that he finished a year ago, I think. So that's coming out soon. It's a one shot. That's cool. Are you, you know, with Comic Craft, are you, you know, I mean, how how often are you taking uh, other jobs? Are you are you working with the big two? Are you, uh, what's? Yes. Um, 
in, in actual fact, I thought last year would be the first year that we did no work for Marvel, and I ended up doing two pages for Marvel 1000 and Marvel 1001. Okay. Three pages. I did the Tim Sale, uh, what the, no, not, is it, not what the, what's it called? Um, now what if? Uh, no, no, the uh, uh, Irving Forbush. Oh, sure, not Brand Eck. Not Brand Eck. They did a not Brand Eck one page bulk story, Jeff and Tim. I did the Mary Jane page with J. Scott Campbell. Those guys always joy to work with. And the Death's Head page, uh, because I was the editor of Death's Head at Marvel UK. Oh, wow. Death's Head and Dragon's Claws, both of which uh, got collected last year, I think. Death's Head got collected and there was a new series. Um and I am really enjoying lettering Batman's grave. So, oh, that's great, man! Yeah, you know that's funny. Hitchy and I are, are hopefully going to be talking soon. Uh, we've been—I mean, I, I've talked to him uh, about when it started, and I did shame on me—I didn't realize you were you were lettering it. It's beautiful, man. It looks well, like Brian and I go way back. I, I gave him his first job when he was sixteen. Um, he worked on uh, Action Force for for me, and in fact, his first. Action Force story was Dan Abnett's first. Wow. Story. Wow. That's um, a good team up. Yeah, man. Jesus. That's amazing. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Dan was an assistant editor at the time, and I gave him his, his first break. And Brian um, worked on Death's Head. And then my very first script for Marvel US, first and last. <laughs> Uh, was She-Hulk issue nine, which was the first issue after John Byrne quit. And I persuaded Bobby Chase to hire um, Brian to draw it. Wow. So I actually introduced him to the American industry as well. Um, That's amazing. So he's blessed him. He has rewarded me by requesting uh, my letters on, uh, we did Hawkman and I'm doing Batman's Grave. And um, that that's a really, I love the tone of Batman's Grave. Uh, I, I was explaining to, I was teaching a lettering class yesterday. And I was explaining that I'm not a big fan of sentence case lettering. But on this series, the, the way I read it is that everything is through Alf, Alfred's eyes. So that e even though there's only like four captions in issue one, the way I approach it is that everything is, is being related by Alfred, even though there's no narrative caption after the first issue. I just think that it's his perspective on the whole Batman situation, because even though there's like 10 pages of Batman kicking ass every single issue, um, it always comes back to the Batcave and Bruce being given a hard time by Alfred. You know, he's very much the yes. Jeremy Irons Alfred. He's sarcastic. He He's drunk in the first issue, hungover in the second, something like that. He's always drinking coffee. And I, <laughs> so I, I, that's my take on the lowercase lettering in Batman's Grave. And I might be wrong, um, but I think it's a nice, it's a very gentle use of sentence case lettering that my initial instinct was no. But I've worked with Warren on enough projects to know that he doesn't he, – he's not somebody who's just like, I don't care how it's lettered. If he says sentence case, there's a reason for it, you know. And, and you know, and I get that. I, you know, I'm working on also on a legendary graphic novel, Dracula. Um, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but it's using the likeness of one of the famous Dracula actors. Maybe that's what I can say. Um and if you've ever read Dracula, oh, my God, so many different narratives. Mina's journal, Jonathan's journal, voiceovers, Van Helt, you know, it's all over the place. Yes. So as a lettering artist working on that, having to make certain journal voices distinctive is quite a challenge. Interesting. That's awesome, man. Very, very cool. I – um you know, I I, I don't want to I don't want to take up too much of your time. Are we? Are, you know, we could we could wrap there if you want and promote. I do want to tell you about 
Oh, please. Yes, your your yes, your poster behind you. Yes, I'm glad and you brought it up again. Mine, but there's a good story attached. Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom in even so people can see it a bit. But, oh. oh, actually, that's gonna cut it off. No, no. Here we go. Oh, lovely. So, oh, there you go, man. One of my favorite amazing. films. Amazing. This is. Oh, I gotta go this way. So, um, one of my neighbors, he's actually in Nashville, is Eric Powell. Oh, sure. And, um, I saw this. Uh, one of the guys that was working at my booth, in San Diego. Um, uh, two years ago, two years ago, um, brought this back. He he had stood in line for the Mondo line. The oh, Mondo. sure. Yes, I love those. And he came poses. back to this, and I was like, dude, why didn't you tell me? You know, I'm a big Planet of the Apes fan. Me too. This is just such a beautiful piece, it, you know. Absolutely. Um, so um, Eric's booth is always – two aisles over from me in the independent press pavilion at San okay. Diego. So I went over and I said, Eric, I'm a big fan of the fan. That is one of the best pieces I've ever seen. And he said to me, oh, um, I have some artist proofs. Would you like one? Wow. And bless him, he sent it to me um, wow. a couple of months later. Not only that, my friend uh, Devin, who had picked it up at the Mondo booth, he ended up having – he left his poster tubes in the bathrooms at San Diego on Sunday night, and they were all stolen. Like within minutes, they'd gone. Wow. And Eric kindly sent another copy to replace the one that was stolen. Wow. So um, – We'll pull back now. Eric and his, his girlfriend, Andrea, came to stay here um, uh, in Chattanooga last year, This probably this time last year. And um, – I said we were. He wanted us to letter the issues of the goon that he's not drawing. No problem. And I said, but I would like to do a trade. I would like you to do an Elephant Men poster as if it's a movie like Beneath Planet of the Apes. So uh, I, I can't show you yet, but the idea actually this year was to have a print of his Elephant Men artwork on sale and printed exactly like this Mondo print. I think <laughs> a four color print. Wow. Um, and I'm hoping that when I open my email today or tomorrow, there'll be a, a color proof to, for me to look at, but he's already done the basic artwork, the, the, the pencils. We, we were going to have it ready in February, but of course with all the, the lockdown and the fate of San Diego, um, so uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that because I think Eric is at the top of his game. Um, to me, he's right up there with Mignola. He's, you know, if you've oh, seen yeah. the art book that came out from Boom, or was it Boom or IDW? Um, beautiful. He, his color artwork is just outstanding. And the goon is hilarious. Agreed. <laughs> I, I've been reading it off and on for many years, and it just makes me laugh out loud. So, um, and I'm hoping that they're considering what well, they, before lockdown, they were considering selling the house and relocating. I think that's probably been put off, but um, we showed them around Chattanooga and it would be great if he was a neighbor, but. Um, oh God. Well, you know, also uh, Mike Norton is working with him uh, on the recent arc, on the most recent yeah. arc. Yeah. So. He's, he's working on nine through 12, I think. We yeah. did. I think Eric's coming back after 12, but um, and there have been some beautiful covers. There's a Steve Rude painted cover. Yeah. yeah. Gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. And, and you know what? The, I, I totally relate to that because when you have your own character and people you admire um, work on it, your character, it's just fanboy central you know <laughs> that's the dream absolutely yeah. man my god then you know you're you're following in the tradition of yeah. ditko and 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 lee and and kirby and seal and schuster and all that so no i get it man and i've heard that from other creators as well it's the highest compliment and yeah. also again yeah that it really just i'm sure it makes you feel like hey i made it okay that's cool you know other other creators that you really respect you know give a shit enough to to do well, your but, stuff and it's but I, but i also think that when you are in the sort of self-publishing landscape, the creator-owned landscape. We, I, I know what Eric has done. 
to get where he is. Mike Mignola knows where Eric, what Eric has done. You know, anyone that has put out their own title year after year after year after year after year. And there was a little thread. Jamie McKelvey was talking about how difficult it is to do a book month in, month out, especially for an artist. You know, I, I'm lucky I'm, I just do the writing and the lettering and the design, you know, um, more than most writers. Yes. But, but for an artist, working on the same characters year after year, you know, I'm not surprised that uh, Fiona Staples needed a break from Saga. You know, um, I'm not surprised that the Wicked and Divine um, wrapped up because when you're putting everything in to your own title, it's a it's a long, lonely road. And if you're lucky, you have a hit. You know, I feel lucky that I have recognition. You know, people know what Elephant Men is, even mm -hmm. if they haven't read it. You know, that that is a threshold that you cross when people know your book, but they haven't yeah. actually read it. Um, you've sort of entered slightly into people's consciousness. Yeah, yeah. But you, you can only do that by sticking around. And sometimes the financial sacrifice, you know, the yeah. turning down other work, uh, you know, putting all your energy into your own titles. You know, I, I am... I'm thinking about I, I'm working on Ask for Mercy with Abigail, and I'm still think I'm thinking about it right now. There's a little machine at the back of my head. I go to sleep and I dream about it, you know, because you have to keep your characters moving forward. You have to keep your stories engaging, and especially with Comicsology, the five issue actually Ask for Mercy six issues in a trade. But you know, I I I want to put out that done in one. You know, with with a, you know, enough reasons to keep reading, but because I don't know if there's going to be another season, each season, I have that sort of Breaking Bad problem of, is this a satisfying end to this? If there's no, if we're not renewed, <laughs> understood. Sure. You know. Yeah. But also, if we are renewed, is there enough for me to keep going beyond? You know, you don't want to tie a knot in it, but you want it to be satisfying to the reader and and for for, for myself and for each artist that I'm working with. So, and that that's challenging. You know, when I was sure. at Image, sometimes I let the story go too far, too long. In volume six of the original Image run, there's ten issues. It's a ten issue story. I wouldn't make that mistake again. I would break it into two. Um, so, I, you know, I'm I'm still learning. Sure. Um, I learned a lot from the beef. I think that was sort of turning point for me. That's exciting, man. No, and, and again, a recurring conversation that I've had with image creators in particular on long running stories of when you get to issue 58, it's like, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, because because there's always new flavors of the month every week that come out. And so the bloom and the initial excitement for Elephant Men. Yeah, it's like okay, well, how, you know, or how do I get new people? You know, and I mean, you Comicsology is making all the difference because Comicsology is a recognized brand. Amazon is a recognized brand. You know, it's easy to find uh, people's work. I have an author page on Amazon now. I'm aware. Um, yes, indeed. You know, all our social media point people to Comicsology. We did a, a, a couple of social media weeks on the beef. We do. We we alternate Elephant Man, Ask for Mercy with the beef. And we point people at Comixology because it's the easiest place to find it. Um, and if you're on Comixology, it's a, it's a, just a, around the corner is Amazon. You can buy the books there. So we now have a safety net that we didn't used to have because single issues are not always available. That's why right. there's a comic book price guide. Right, of um, course. But if, if you want to read an issue, and you know, you and I come from that era of. You know, having little, did you have little lists with the numbers you were missing? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, and we, used to, I used to go to back issue stores or, or markets looking for one issue just so I could read it. Yep. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't a collector. I, I wanted to read it because I was reading read part of the story and there was no trade paperbacks. Yep. No comicsology. Absolutely. The readers today, they're spoiled. They're so spoiled because you can get <laughs> omnibuses, you can get trades. 
you can go on eBay or you can get Marvel Unlimited and and you know or you know whatever and like yeah just enjoy Other services are available yeah um, <laughs> you know I I used to it was such a joy if I found an issue of Conan that I was missing you know because I followed the Roy Thomas John Buscema run and I loved that stuff but sometimes sure. I'd be missing an issue and and finally I think when I went to college I sub I got a subscription service from conquistador books and and they mailed them to me at college which is like bliss i hear you man that's hilarious um did so you comiXology is is making a big difference to the way people can read and collect agreed that's cool did you want to mention what you've been doing on facebook uh when you're lost uh oh that's grant morrison yeah right so, <laughs> no, it, um so you know there's quite a big uh there's a lot of Facebook groups centered around Zoids, which was a toy line, a Japanese toy line that's still, I think there's still new toys today in Japan. And um, it was a, the, one of the first books that I was in any way involved editorially and my first script at Marvel UK, my first professional script ever six page zoid story spider-man and zoids issue 12 if anybody wants to look it up drawn by the amazing steve parkhouse who's also who's a triple threat writer artist letterer um his resident alien i think just got optioned or oh wow good for him that's yeah. awesome and um so i was sort of I, I regarded Zoids as something that I was very close to. And, and I, as I say, I, I was working editorially. I, my boss wrote it, so I gave him editorial notes. And um, we brought in Grant Morrison to take it over when I think Ian had sort of run out of ideas. Okay. And Grant started writing it. It was around the time that Alan Moore was writing Swamp Thing. And Grant was very definitely in that. Alan Moore tone, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it was slightly out there, but it was, it was Terminator two. It was aliens. It, it had a great sci-fi tone. Um, and it ran for 50 issues. Wow. Spider-Man and Zoids 50 issues being one year in british oh okay comics. oh yeah because weekly obviously yeah and it was only four or five pages an issue but that's that's enough material we did some collected comics steve yoll um worked on it kev hopgood who co-created war machine and um we were going to launch it as an american monthly and grant wrote three scripts uh, Steve Yoll penciled the first issue. Dave Hine inked the first 12 pages of the first issue. And then the plug was pulled. So I had lettered 12 pages. I, ke I kept copies of them. I, I've, I've kept, I kept them. I brought them from England. I kept them with me for years thinking, you never know. <laughs> we, we might, you know, Grant Morrison's a hit now. Uh, maybe we'll finish this series, but Steve Yole had gone on to other things. Okay. Anyway, 12 years ago, I, 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 I think I ran into Steve at a convention. I said, did you, did you pencil the whole issue? He said, oh, yeah, I've still got them. I said, send me scans because I had the first, I still have the first three scripts. Okay. Uh, or, yeah, the first three scripts. And so 12 years ago, I lettered them and forgot about them. <laughs> And uh, recently I was looking for something else and found the files. I was looking actually for photographs of um, the Elephant Men booth at, at, at comic conventions because I was going to do a photo album of like, there's no convention this year, so here's all the hits from previous years. Sure. And while I was looking for that, I found these files, tweaked them, and posted them on Facebook. Um and Twitter and my Twitter following just went through the roof. Cool. Um, and uh, it's the first time that that material has been seen. I think I think there were some low res scans of the inks. Okay. Uh, the letters 
from the first half, but nobody had read the whole thing. So it was brand new Grant Morrison, Steve Yoll, Zoids, for everybody that never even knew what Zoids was. But, but as I say, very popular. I've had quite a lot of comments in various Facebook Zoids groups. That's awesome, man. No, and I'm, uh, that's that's great. Paul Kupperberg, uh, one of the great uh, American. Eric editors. Powell just sent me an email. <laughs> he, he did, who did? Eric Powell. He oh, sent, just now? He said, yeah. So after we get off, I'm going to the, the Elephant Men artwork he's been working Here's on. Here's open, man. That's fantastic. I certainly hope so. Yeah, Paul's like that. Paul has kept interesting little tidbits, including uh, some prose Superman stories that were in the back of, an, of British annuals of, of oh, yeah. you know, collected stories and stuff. And yeah, so I mean, no, it, it, it always is interesting to see these creators and, at and their we, beginning. And we don't know what's interesting because for us, it's like I, I have been putting those Xerox copies of Zoids from one filing cabinet to another, from one folder to another for years. And I just, oh, there's that, I put that over there. You know, you don't want to throw it away. But I don't know what's in my little tubs. You know, when I moved here, I had to just throw stuff in plastic tubs and get them on the the truck. And um, but but you know, a lot of us don't know what little gems are are hiding in our collections because eh, yeah, you know, I don't I don't know if that's important to anyone. So it was nice to it was nice to to put something out there during isolation that people were like, oh my gosh. That's it's awesome, man. The Lost Ark of the Zoids Covenant. <laughs> no, but I understand. And again, that's that's terrific. And I'm glad that you're I'm glad you're hanging out of that stuff because yeah, you never know. I mean, it, it definitely could connect and, and yeah, to see their work at such an early age is and, wonderful. And, and the Zoids material. I, I think we did a great job on that, and no one has ever collected it in trade paperback form. I think IDW sort of made some noises because of Grant's name. Um, Are there so, other Marvel uh, characters that show up, or is it purely the Zoid universe? It's just Zoids, yeah. Okay. And it's, and it's, a, but it's a nice, hard sci-fi. I, again, it's like a little bit Terminator, a little bit Aliens, a little bit Lost in Space. Um, I really enjoyed working on it. It was It was where I came into my own as a pen letterer at Marvel UK. Um, and, you know, Simon Furman sort of owned the Transformers in our office. He worked okay. at the office from me. And so I sort of took Zoids and ran with it and, and you know, it became my little pet project. And, and, and seeing Grant, you know, go from strength to strength because um, they went from Zoids to Zenith. You know, okay. and Zenith is a, a better known British comic book character because, of course, he's a superhero. He's the first 2000 AD superhero, probably the last as well. But, um, <laughs> but that's how I, I put Grant and Steve together. Steve together, not on Zoids, on GI Joe. They did a quick kick uh, story for me t in order to introduce Master of Kung Fu. It was a five-page story where Quick Kick told readers about the Master of Kung Fu because I wanted to run the Paul Goulassey Master of Kung Fu issues in the back of G.I. Joe because it had that martial arts connection. Oh, yeah. And and because the Paul Goulassey issues are just gorgeous. I completely agree, man. No, I'm a huge yeah. fan, and I've met him a few – I saw him last year in uh, in uh, Portland when I, when I was yeah, there. I saw him once, and I, I can't remember if I had the nerve. You know, it's funny that, you know, the people that we grew up with, we sort of intimidated by. And I, I've had to get over that as I've got older because I really appreciate it when people come up to me, young people come up to me and say how much they enjoy my work. And I'm like, oh, I, I should do that. I should tell the people that I look up to that I enjoy their work because it hadn't occurred to me to go and say hello. And I rue the day that John Buscema and Jack Kirby were at the same San Diego Comic Con and I didn't stop and say "Oh yeah, how much their work meant to me, especially John yeah. Buscema. You know, wow. Conan yeah. probably kept me reading comics when I, when I was, you know, more interested in girls and music. But Sa Savage Sword of Conan, I, I loved that book. 
That's awesome, man. No, I get it. And I and yeah, I mean, I feel the same way in terms of meeting meeting those creators and stuff that inspired us. I, again, you know, we we lost Denny O'Neill this weekend, and I uh, had the opportunity to interview him a few times. Yeah, I saw on your Facebook page. I was going to listen to uh, a couple of those this week. So, yeah, well, that's cool. You know, and as always, I appreciate the conversation, and uh, you know, uh, great stuff. Yeah, coming. don't leave it so long next time, John. Don't leave I, it. So I, long. I, I I promise I won't. Honestly, Richard, when I'm well, getting old. <laughs> we're all getting old. Okay, right. I know, man. I can't. I, that's why I'm embarrassed that it's been more than ten years since we've talked. Uh, no, uh, when when Elephant Men's ready, when the next volume's ready and stuff, please come back because sure. I really do. I keep meaning to have that more of of a Marvel UK conversation, but you have so much new stuff to talk about. I'm glad that we did, and uh, you know, uh, I mean, that's that's the great thing. I mean, again, the beef, pick it up, and the second vo volume of um, and forgive me, I'm. I'm you can, you're going to beat me to my uh, ask, what, for what mercy. ask for mercy. Absolutely. With you and Abigail, Jill Harding. Uh, I loved volume one and volume two uh, is collected on Wednesday and yep. you're in the midst of volume three. So that's great. Yep. And, yep. Uh, and I'm, yeah, and catch up on elephant men, catch up on the, on the, uh, beyond the 80, uh, 80 issues and stuff and what you've been doing at comiXology's originals. That's terrific stuff, man. And I'm so glad. Right. Yeah. And I, I really, I'm glad in all the directions that you're going into writing wise and stuff and, Glad Comic Craft is chugging along, but yeah, when Elephant Man's ready, we'll, we'll we can do this again. So sure. yeah, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, we'll, I'm sure Pamela will alert me, but I'm glad we did this now because yeah. then, then I, then I will keep my promise of uh, less than ten years in, in our next conversation. And I believe that the next season of Elephant Man starts July seventh on Comicsology. That's when we do the monthly release schedule, and then it's collected later in the year. So, um. Follow me on Twitter. Give give all your places to uh, you I, have people follow I, you, buddy. I think I'm at Rich Starkings on Twitter. I'm very accessible on Facebook, Richard Starkings. You can follow us at Comic Craft if you're interested in fonts. Um, and I'm on Instagram, Pinterest as well, if you care to. Depending on your social media platform of interest. And if you're if you're a self creator, then uh, to uh, take advantage of Richard's uh, website where he sells uh, fonts, and that's comicbookfonts.com. There you go, man. Absolutely. Thank you. My and man. I'm impressed that you stuck with your logo. That's good branding, John. I love that uh, logo. That that's Shane, a good logo. Shane, it's very Shane. similar to the Comic Craft one. It's just uh, uh oh. <laughs> no, no, it's different, it's, it's different colors. But you know, I, I I'm all about branding. I think it's um, you know, that with the beef. It's like the only place you see the logo differently is on the spine of the book. And that was reluctant to put the word the in front of the beef. But, you know, branding, you know, yeah. the, the beef wasn't just about um, burgers. It was about <laughs> corporate branding, you know, and, uh, yeah. you know, we, we all have to make that work for ourselves. And, and this Matrix background, I like that. Well, you know, uh, Franco, the artist, uh, depicted me as like kind of Larry King. <laughs> and put me in the put me in the suspenders and the blue shirt and everything. Yeah. And so yeah, this is kind of a, a a blow up of the map of the United States that used to be behind Larry right. King on CNN all those years. And and the word balloon logo, I just love how it ironically the way that we're positioned and stuff usually ends up on the guest's head. Yeah, and it's kind of perfect that yeah, exactly. It's like you know, right there. There's the dialogue. There's, so there's the screen snap. <laughs> Pleasure as always, man. I appreciate the conversation. Thanks, and uh, John. Thank you, sir. Yeah, take it easy. Thanks again for watching another Word Balloon video. We've got plenty more at our channel, Word Balloon. If you enjoyed it, please like it and consider subscribing to the channel. And of course, support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Thanks a lot for watching.